I, the first question is for you, Edward. You know, this project comes your way. What made you want to commit countless hours of your life to making this film come to life? I mean, it's complete stupidity, right? Uh, idiocy. Um, no, uh, it, it's, it, it's, I think it felt immediately like a, uh, an immense challenge, uh, something that, uh, a hurdle that you can easily not jump over and, and, and ruin it. So it felt like a, a challenge that I wanted to take. But mostly it's a, a, an opportunity that, that comes along very rarely because it's, it's not a cheap movie and so the financing is hard to get. And um, and also, it's a story that we can rarely tell in Germany because in America, uh, there's a very different approach to these types of films. You know, obviously, you have a very different history. Uh, America was roped into two wars. The second one, they liberated Europe from fascism. So there's a lot of, uh, in, a, in a way, there's this, you know, probably a sense of honor and pride about those uh, two historical events. Whereas in Germany, uh, there's you can't tell a story like that, and it's it's usually, uh, you know, it's 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 uh, you know, there's just in in us there's a sense of guilt or shame or responsibility about history, and that informs the film. So if you're an American filmmaker or a British filmmaker, you make a film that has that sense of pride in the film or. Th and if you're, uh, ideally, I, I assume if you uh, make a German film, it just feels very different. I thought that that uh, is a good opportunity to share with the, uh, you know, other countries. Well, um, obviously, yes, very true. <laughs> obviously, um, we won't ask what the actual budget is, but I, th uh, when we spoke a, a couple weeks ago, uh, you had mentioned that people would be shocked that it is nowhere near what you were able to achieve on screen. How did you pull that off, having such an epic scale on, on what you were provided with? I mean, I, I think an in, in, uh, incredible, uh, incredible amount of enthusiasm uh, from the team. And, uh, and it's also, I mean, budgets are just different in America to Europe, you know? And, and Eastern, you, we shot this in Prague. So, uh, and from with a crew from all over the world, uh, from England, from Prague, from uh, France, from uh, Germany. And so a lot of uh, good people came together. I think the title attracts a great crew. And, and then I think a lot of planning also, just not wasteful uh, management of the resources. So we, we, we basically uh, spent I think I and the cameraman spent three months locked in a hotel room in Berlin and just pre-planned every single shot and drew it and uh, did storyboards and hung them eventually on the wall, like the entire, his entire hotel room. And there was COVID, so there was no room service or no food anywhere. So we once in a while, I usually uh, came to the hotel room and locked him in and then I went home and then the next morning I came back and brought him some food and then we continued working. Um, and um, uh, and so we spent a couple months in this tiny hotel room and just sort of really planned the movie and then hung it up on the wall, eventually the pictures, and edited the film on a wall, looking at the picture and talking through it and then realizing, oh, we're not going to need that shot and this one we should maybe make longer or slightly different, adapted, so we drew it again. And eventually we sort of had the film on, on a wall and shot it exactly like we had planned. I mean, not much difference. Uh, so I think that also is helpful in terms of uh, uh, spending your resources that you have. Well, I, I want to ask these gentlemen some questions as well, but I just wanted a quick follow up on that. You're on set, the weather's not what you want, um, you know, something breaks or whatever, you have stuck everything to the storyboard. How stressful is that to just go every day and, and just try to attempt to pull off what you have, you know, gone to the... The shots that, that uh, I mean, to me it was very stressful because the shots weren't easy. Because usually they were very long shots and you have actors, and for the human element, you have actors, you have crew, you have the weather, and so things go wrong. You know, like the, you have a gun in your hand, it's 100 years old, so it jams, 
you know, you, you spend like two, three minutes, the shot goes, you think everything's perfect. And then in the very end, one of the, you know, one of the actors, like for example, the opening sequence, it's a young actor, maybe 19 years old or so, and he has this gun, and then he tries to shoot and, you know, it jams, so you have to go again. Or the sun comes out, and we didn't want sun. So usually uh, things went wrong 15 times, and on the 16th time, it somehow worked magically. And somehow, and for the 15 times, you think, like, we're never, ever going to get this shot. It just doesn't work. It's too complicated. And should we be rethinking this? But somehow, in the very end, it you know, if you just keep with it, in the very end, the shots usually worked out. Well, Felix, I want to ask you, this is your first uh, on-screen role. Um, what was the audition process like? I mean, also, by the way, absolutely fantastic. <laughs> What was the audition process like, and uh, did you think you nailed it when, when you did your audition? Well, I, um, the story behind the audition is quite funny because um, I, I started working in theater a few years ago. So I came from acting school and started working at, in Vienna State Theater, and um, I worked with a dramaturg, Sabrina Zwach, and um, her husband, Malte Grunert is our producer. So um, she worked with me and she said, maybe he's the one, maybe you want to try him. And uh, after a few weeks, I got a phone call by the casting director and we did six months of casting. And I did, I think, three e-castings and three or four live castings in Berlin. And in September, October, you sit in a park with friends have a picnic and suddenly you get a phone call and it's Edward and he tells you we're going to see us in Prague <laughs> and uh, then you start <laughs> celebrating. <laughs> um, what about the, the part excited you? What about playing Paul um, made you excited as an actor? Well obviously it's, it's this novel, it's the story that's, that has been told in the 30s as a movie, uh, in the 70s as a movie and um, which is the, the most printed German novel worldwide ever. Um, so, of course, that is intriguing, but at the same time, it's, it felt to me like it was a time to tell it, f maybe something you would think too. Um, it was time to tell the story again, but from another generation, because since the 70s, generations have just changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think you can, each, each version of the movie, 30, 79, and now 2023, uh, 22, is just like a representation of its generation. It's, it shows how we deal with pictures of war and um, coping with war. So I'm very glad I could work on this new interpretation of the story. Well, you're all fantastic. Daniel, uh, Daniel, Daniel, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, you know, you're playing one of the few uh, real historical figures uh, in the film. Did you feel like you needed to do research uh, to play him? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, I was surprised uh, about how little I knew about this um, very fascinating man in German uh, history and, and, and politics. Um, so I, yeah, I um, read his biography um, and was uh, very impressed. Um, a very charismatic uh, figure, uh, a provincial politician from uh, the south of Germany who climbed up the ladder and ended up in the high politics in Berlin. Uh, always, you know, with a, a strong conviction, values, uh, and morality, uh, and he was targeted by the far right uh, very early on by, for example, uh, opposing against the, the colonial politics of the German Reich, um, but never got intimidated. Um, and I found it very appealing to open up the film to have this layer which gives us a, a, a very interesting historical and political, uh, you know, context uh, to, to that story. Um, also, I find it always very brave to, uh, if you touch a holy material like uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, to be bold enough to, to add something new if it's, you know, 
um, in, in, in the context of the story, it is accurate and it feels right because cinematically speaking, the structure at the end is very interesting if you go back and forth between the train and the trenches and you might think, oh, what a relief to be in that train. On the other hand, you find it shocking, you know, everything is so neat and polished and you have these few men who decide over the fate of all these thousands of, of young soldiers. So I, I, I found this very um, appealing. Well, I know you've recently um, put on a producing hat and started producing uh, projects. What made you want to be an executive producer on this as well? Well, I, um, the driving force behind this project was clearly uh, Malte Kronert, who is here with us, the, the producer. And so, um, a big applause. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I joined this wonderful man and his company after having met him at a film called uh, Most Wanted Man back in the days. and. Uh, <coughs> we quickly realized that we uh, share the same, you know, desires and 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 um, and taste. Uh, we always wanted to find interesting German material which has an international appeal. And so I remember the conversation that we then one day had when he called me and said, "Listen, I found a great new adaptation of All Quiet on the Western Front, and it's in English, but we should do it in German because it has, ne has never been done." And it was a real epiphany. I thought, like, "Oh my God, yes, we 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 have to do that." And um, yeah, and he put it together. Um, well, Volar, I wanted to ask you, obviously you and Edward worked together on Patrick Melrose. I'm, I'm assuming that's how you guys knew each other. Yes. Uh, what about the project excited you? Well, it's, uh, first of all, the, the story was, you know, something that I, like the book I read as well when I was in school. And um, I mean, you know, a film that is dealing with the fate of young men uh, being thrown in something that is you know, with it, that are going with an enthusiasm into something that is actually not, you know, pro that is promising in the first place, but ending very dramatically, um, is something that I was, I was very attached to because I, I was the first, I'm the first generation or the first parent that uh, is having kids that have no parents that went to war. My parents went, uh, experienced civil war um, they were born in 1931, so in a way, I would say that is passed on, you know, m me uh, on me and my generation in a way that, uh, of course, everything was, you know, we are save we were saving food and we were like it was always a little bit like, um, you know, that things were um, that way they were passing on some experiences from that time. And so when I saw, th when I read this, uh, the script again and, uh, and I saw the film, I think I, f I actually um, saw the film first because it was already nearly finished. Um, I had the feeling that um, this is very inspiring because it has, at the same time, it is very dramatic and it needs some very violent elements in the music. I would say like very raw um, elements. It needs at, at the same time some poetic elements to describe I would say the length of life in a way, you know, that is in their case very short and that is dictated by people that have already lived 70 years, which I think is very egoistic. And, um, and they were just, uh, and it's, it's showing the, the absurdity of war in a, in, a big, in a big way. And I thought to describe that with music and finding an instrument um, like the harmonium that I used for the, for the main theme that is coming from that time. I think that was a quite a challenge for me, and I, I loved uh, that Edward was asking me to join the project. You know. Well, I know he's sitting right here, but do you remember what Edward said to you was the most important thing to him about what the score would sound like? Yeah, absolutely. He said, I want to have something from you that I've never done before. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I went back home, and uh, it's uh, actually a little bit... That's what I love love about Edward, and I think you can sense that in the whole um, group of people um, around um, the film, that there is no, there is a very positive encouragement of going beyond what you've done before, which is, uh, I think, every artist's dream in a way that he can develop from where he's standing right now to go into the next, onto the next level and have somebody who is actually pushing you gently into that area rather than, uh, you know, screaming at you or like saying, what is this, you know? 
uh, or yeah, please uh, do the, the most, the thing that you've never done before. And then the next week, he says, no, I don't want to have that. You know, and it's really, um, uh, I think when I sent him the first three notes, this theme, the do, 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 when I sent him that, um, that was the day after we watched the movie the first time together. Um, that is a very, when you, when you feel that this is your in inspiration of the film and you send it out, it's a very raw thing because when you get a feedback, um, I don't like it, then you go home and you're very, um, you don't know what to do, what you can do next, or mm -hmm. if there's anything else that you can do. Well, my next, my next question is for uh, Edward and Felix. You know, um, uh, many war films, uh, actors go through a boot camp uh, to sort of learn what their character would, would know in a, in a, as a soldier. I, I don't know if that was necessary here, but was that part of the process at all, or no? It's a great question for you to answer, but but also when uh, just to uh, add to Volker, when he sent me that, you know, it's so funny. Now, now you could just get send a little video, like you screen it on a movie, um, on in a theater, and we watch it together. And then the next day, he sends me his first idea in terms of the music, and you just get sent a little video, and you watch it on the computer. But it really blew me away because, and I called him up and said, "Oh, this." This sounds like Led Zeppelin, you know, and so and I I kept calling it I kept calling it the Led Zeppelin uh, chords. So can you do more Led Zeppelin like on this other part? And so basically, that's determined the entire soundtrack. Huh? Those three notes and uh, the, the Led Zeppelin uh, sound. But yeah, boot camp. That was the real question. Uh, yeah, we we had we had a kind of a boot camp in the. First, it was the first week during um, preparing in Prague, and we, uh, we as a, as a team, the actors, we were training with the stunt department just to get used to military movements, uh, marching commands, and um, it was it was very helpful. But I think in the end, what really was our boot camp was our individual preparation. Um, for this movie, because we all did something completely different, but in the end, we found out it all led us to the same point um, where, we'd, where we would work as, as comrades, basically. So today, I, uh, um, I learned something new from Felix that I'd never heard before. And uh, so a method that he developed in terms of his, uh, uh, in terms of knowing how to act in each individual scene, I was really blown away that Edward didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you we kept it from me. Well, you didn't ask. It. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, what was it? Um, well, I'm coming from theater. I only know working from A to B. So in theater, you start a performance and you end in the end, and then it's over. So you're doing the whole story, but obviously when shooting a movie, you're not working chronologically. So, for example, the scene where Paul is completely devastated in the end, we shot it on day four. And since I've never shot a movie before, I thought, how am I going to do this? Um, because I don't know how. Uh, you know, shooting the last scene on the first day, how is it going to work? And um, I developed, uh, maybe out of despair, <laughs> I developed a system um, that's basically an Excel spreadsheet um, because I, I'm quite rational and logic and um, I love numbers. And um, I developed an Excel spreadsheet that uses multiple categories for the character and each category has multiple levels of energy. So um, you have every scene linked to multiple categories and then again multiple levels of energy and so you can see um, it looks like a text uh, text uh, it's like a spreadsheet sheet. yeah like a spreadsheet or a from the text uh, stuff um, and you can see the development of the character and um, it looks very technical but to me it was so helpful because it gave me something to hold on and to rely on during the shoot and um, 
I'm going to work like this and with this spreadsheet for all the shoots that are coming. Well, <laughs> that's amazing. I have to tell you that as, as a journalist, many times we see a, a film and we see an actor and we, seem, we think that they've done this, that they've like tracked every single thing so that they know. But I was going to ask Daniel, have you ever done anything like this on a role that you've done? My spreadsheet was breakfast, lunch, <laughs> dinner. <laughs> No, I uh, uh, no. It's like you know, chronology. You would write down in your uh, uh, script uh, on which day are you shooting what, and in which state are you uh, uh, in which particular moment. So of course, you know, you're looking what happened before, what happened later. But this is another level. <laughs> you 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 should see it. It's like uh, this this man is a is a mastermind. Um, well, Edward, I wanted to ask you. You know, you, you talk about him doing one of his, his toughest scenes like so early. Did you do that on purpose in case you needed to go back and do it again? Was yeah, it did just you do that on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> just to just to torture you. I knew um, it. Um, I no, knew it. Um, it's uh, was it really day four? I can I think remember it was, it was the scene oh, yeah, right. where he yeah, yeah, puts yeah. the bayonet on in the very last scene. It was day four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely right. I remember. Yeah, and Felix um, told I me apologize now retroactively. Uh, no, it's uh, there's so many factors. That, yeah. You know, we don't have the money to really uh, schedule it uh, consecutively, or, and, and the location is only available then, or uh, you know, it just doesn't fit otherwise. It's not definitely not on purpose. I'd rather shoot it chronologically, but in the end, uh, you have to, you know, you know, make it in the most economical way. And I'm curious, Felix, did that give you confidence getting through that scene for the rest of the film? Uh, I think it was a, I don't know what's the word in English, but it's a, 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 like baptized by fire, you know? <laughs> that works. Um, so it was the first shock on day four. Ah, okay, that's, that's the level we have to reach. And from that moment on, I knew what what was on the stakes, so it was really quite easy from that point. <laughs> it was it was really interesting because we did six takes that day. I remember exactly. It's when Felix and with the whole troop walks up to this ridge and looks over the battlefield just before the final battle. And uh, you know the story is really about the death of your soul in a way that uh, you're gonna have to you know, kill something inside of you to survive or kill the other person so that you can, it becomes, you become a survival beast. You kill everything else in order so that you can hang on to life. But life is actually not worth anything anymore because if you go home, you have no, you know, you no connection to your home anymore and to you what's inside of you. Everything is dead inside. So he needed to be, the character needed to be dead inside at that point. So we did, you know, it was a complicated shot again, and a few times we screwed up with the camera, and Felix was always perfect, of course, but we didn't capture it. And um, and I remember uh, on the fifth take, he, he just burst into tears. And it I was completely devastated, but and, and at the same time, I knew it's not really right for the scene because the person doesn't have tears anymore. They've, they've been cried a long time ago. And so, and then you're kind of respectful and shy about it, or I, at least I am. So I went up to him and <laughs> didn't quite know how to put it. So like, actually, Felix, I think maybe it's better not to cry. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, and he just said, yeah, no. You know, but he <laughs> didn't, he couldn't, he couldn't control it at that point. And then the sixth take was just the empty one. Then. And that's the one that's in the film. Well, um, yeah, it's fantastic. A great scene. And uh, you you'd mentioned earlier um, an important thing about this film, that this story had not been in the German language before. It hadn't been spoken. And obviously, it's been on Netflix now for uh, a couple of months. I'm just curious for, for all of you, what's the reaction you've heard back home? Like, what do are, are people proud that this story has come out this way? Does it matter to them? Is it just any reaction you guys have heard? Um, I'm, I'm, I personally, I'm very grateful for the reaction because I get uh, a lot of emails from, uh, which I've never gotten before for any other film, 
maybe you know once in a while you, the agent gets an email that forwards you from a colleague or something. And but this time I'm suddenly I don't know how, but like people out of the blue sent me emails, and I don't know where they got my email or because it's never anywhere, and uh, and just sort of and from any country, from many many different countries. Um, saying that they enjoyed the movie and that, that it's a perspective that they're interested in seeing. So I'm very grateful for that disruption. And you won't know what it means to us. You know, we make, you know, films, sometimes they're smaller, sometimes they hit the audience and sometimes the audience responds. Sometimes they don't, you know, and the movie just disappears. And that this movie now, th I mean, this is the mecca of movie making. And I'm from a pretty small town in Germany and I never knew how to make movies. And it, it was never on the agenda of becoming a director because I, when I was growing up, I thought actors make movies, you know, because they they speak the lines, so and they get filmed, and you think that well, they made up the lines, and then somehow I never thought about is there a camera person, is there a director, and I just and when I found out there is a director, I thought oh that's I'm really interested in that, I want to make that, and so to now have a film in the home of filmmaking that we can show to you. It's an incredible honor and it uh, really means a lot. Well, yes, it's fantastic. Um, well, gentlemen, I want to thank you all so much. Uh, the movie is absolutely superb and uh, you should be so proud of it and wishing you all the best uh, over this award season. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very, very much for coming.